I want you to stand. I have been preaching countdown to the end, and I'm going to continue that countdown to the end today. I'm going to be talking a message that I think is so applicable, so applicable. Revelation chapter 6 verse 1 says this. Let me say this first of all, folks. There's only one book in the Bible that God said, I'll bless you if you read and study. Only one. And it's the book of Revelation. A blessing comes to us when we read, study the book of Revelation. Revelation. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. The beasts there were angelic seraphims. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast saying, Come and see. Let us pray. God, I simply pray today that you will speak to us and through us. That man, woman, boy, girl here that doesn't know you as personal Savior, may today they come to know you. And Jesus, for all you do, we're going to praise you. For I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about what will happen during the tribulation period. What will happen during the tribulation period? I want you to understand, when the Bible was written, the Bible was written by 40 different men on three different continents over a 1,500-year period. But when the Bible was written, 25% of God's Word was prophetic. That is to say, when the Bible was written, there were over 1,000 prophecies. I want you to know, 500, over 500 of those prophecies have been fulfilled to perfect detail. Perfect detail. In Psalms 22, verses 16 through 18, it's the prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. You say, that's interesting, Pastor Benny. It really is interesting. It's really interesting because when that was written, it was 100 years later before the Romans invented the crucifixion. It's pretty amazing that it was prophesied and it was a hundred years later before the Romans actually even invented crucifixion. In Isaiah 45, Isaiah prophesied that a man, by the, a Persian king by the name of Cyrus would rule the known world. He did. He did. He, he overcame the Medes, the Lydians, and uh, the Babylonians. And this Persian king, Cyrus, ruled the known world. But Isaiah prophesied that it was going to happen, look folks, about 160 years before it actually happened. That would be like, this is not a political statement, it's just making a point. That would be like in 1860, if Abraham Lincoln said, in 2016, Donald J. Trump is going to become president. He didn't do that. But he would be just like that. In, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln said, Donald J. Trump is going to become president in 2016. It happened just like it was prophesied. Somebody said prophecy is the most credible proof of the divine inspiration of God. Amen. Prophecy is the most credible proof of the divine inspiration of God. I've been asked a lot of times, Pastor, where are we in prophecy? Where's the world? Where are we right now? Well, this book of Revelation, it's not Revelations, it's Revelation. It was a revelation that John got, John the Revelator got on the Isle of Patmos. But I want you to understand something. Who was it written to, Pastor Benny? It was written to seven churches in Asia Minor. The number seven in the Bible means perfection. Now, there were more churches in Asia Minor at this time than just seven. Seven represents perfection. It represents completion. It represents time periods. So the reason why there were seven churches, it represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the rapture of the church. There were seven churches, seven time periods. We get to the last time period. It's the Laodicean church. This is what the Bible said to the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, 17. 
Because thou sayest, thou art rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Where are we, ladies and gentlemen? We're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But God says you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And then we get to verse 20. And God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in with him. I'll sup with him and he with me. What's he trying to do? He's trying to get into the church. Somebody said, Pastor, we need God in our schools. (laughs) We need God in our government. Get real, folks. God's trying to get in our churches. (laughs) God's trying to get in our churches. He's standing at the door knocking because we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. We've got everything. We don't need him. We don't need him because we've got everything. But God says you're wretched and you're miserable and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked and you're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So where are we? I'll tell you where we are. We're the Laodicean age. And look what happens in Revelation chapter four, verse one. And I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as a trumpet with me, which said, come up hither. (laughs) What is that, pastor? It's the rapture of the church. (laughs) We're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And God says, when you get to that point, that's when I'm going to come back and I'm going to rapture my church out and my church is going to go and be with me. So pastor, the church gets raptured out. We go to be with the Lord. What happens? There's five things I want you to see is going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen is a militant conquest. A militant conquest. If you look at verse 1 and verse 2, the four beasts say, come and see. And then in verse 2, they tell us what you need to see. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. You said, Pastor, is this Christ? No, it's the Antichrist. It's the Antichrist. Notice his weapon is not the sword. Jesus' weapon, according to Revelation 9, 15, is the sword out of his mouth. His weapon is his word. His weapon is his word. But the weapon here is a bow. Notice not only does it say he has a bow, but it says there's no arrows. What does it say? The Antichrist is going to come on the scene, and he's going to conquer through a bloodless war. He's going to conquer because literally the Antichrist will come on the scene and he will bring peace. See, the church is raptured out. The church is gone. And they will be chaos here. And always remember, every world leader, ladies and gentlemen, always rises out of chaos. When did Hitler come on the scene? Came on the scene during the Great Depression because every dictator always rises during chaos. The Antichrist will rise on the scene. It'll be a militant conquest, but there'll not be any shots fired because Daniel 9 and 27 says he'll sign a covenant to protect Israel and let Israel know you're at peace. I'm going to protect you for seven years. So I want you to see what's going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen, there's going to be a militant conquest. But then there's a second thing that's going to happen. There's going to be murderous conflicts. Look what verse 3 says. It says, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast saying, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Red represents bloodshed. And power was given to him that sat to take peace from the earth, and he that that they should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So here's what the Bible says. At first, during the tribulation, there'll be peace. But then war will happen. I want you to understand something. What's happening right now with Russia in the Ukraine, with Putin, is simply a prelude to what is going to happen. You said, Pastor Benny, do you think 
Vladimir Putin could be the leader when this happens? It's very likely. In all probability, because I think we're in the e evening times, it's very likely that this man will, will be the leader that invades. Because the Bible tells us that Russia will lead forces that will invade Israel. You read about it in Ezekiel chapter 38. Look what it says. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. That's a, that's a worldly leader. That's a, it's a prince. It's a person. The land of Magog. That's the land that's in Russia down by the Black Sea. The chief prince. That little word chief in the Hebrew is the word Rosh. R-O-S-H. Which is the root word of Russia. The chief prince of Meshach. That's the Hebrew word for Moscow. And Tubal, which is a large city in Russia. And prophesy against him. Now, what's, 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 what's Russia going to do? Well, it's going to, Russia will form an alliance. Look what verse 5 says. Persia. In 1935, Persia became Iran. Russia and Iran are working together even as we speak with their nuclear program. Ethiopia, which is Sudan, which literally one of the greatest enemies of Israel. And Libya with them, all of them, with shield and helmet. Gomer, which is modern day Germany. And the house of Togomar, which is Turkey. These nations, the Bible says, led by Russia, will invade Israel. Now here's the question. Pastor, when is it going to happen? Well, the Bible is very clear. Look what verse 8 says. After many days, thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back with sword and gathered out of many people. Wait. Israel, for 2,000 years, were out of the land. They've gathered back, prophecy, and look what it says. They'll even come back from the mountains of Israel. You gotta understand, up to 1967, Jordan controlled the mountains of Israel. But after 1967, Israel again controlled the mountains of Israel. So this prophecy literally being fulfilled right before our very eyes, but going back to the scripture, it says, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell, look, safely all of them. When is it going to happen? When Israel feels safe in the land. When Israel feels safe in the land, right after the Antichrist signs a covenant to protect them, the war will happen. And here's what's going to happen in that war. 84% of the forces that come against Israel will be killed. Because folks, when you touch Israel, you touch the apple of God's eye. 84% of the forces will be killed and literally the Bible says it will take seven months just to bury the dead. 84% of them killed seven months just to bury the dead. You got to understand, when the Cold War was going on, only America and the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. But today Iran, France, China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, Israel has 200 nuclear weapons. So here's what I want you to see. Zechariah 14 and 12 says, and the Lord will send a plague on all the nations that fought against Jerusalem and the people will become like walking corpses and flesh rotted away. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. It's prophecy of a nuclear war. See, I want you to see the murderous conflicts. But there's something else I want you to see. I want you to see the meager crops. Look what verse 5 and 6 says. It says, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast saying, come and see, and beheld and lo, a black horse. Get this, folks. Black represents famine, according to Lamentations 5 and 10. It always represents famine. Now go back to the scripture, a black horse. 
And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. That means food during the tribulation period will be proportioned out. There will be such a famine, food will be proportioned out. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, a measure of wheat for a penny. What? A penny was a day's wages in biblical time. What's it saying? A man literally during the tribulation period will work all day long just for a quart of wheat. There will be such a famine. Food prices will skyrocket. That's why people will be receptive to the mark of the beast. Because a man will work all day just for a quart of wheat. It will be inflation like we've never seen inflation. Grocery prices going through the roof. Do you realize this, folks? Facts are stubborn things. Facts are stubborn things. But the last 12 months has been the largest increase in grocery prices since 1981. The last 12 months is the largest increase in grocery prices since 1981. Could the stage be even being set right now? Could this all be a prelude to what's going to happen where millions on top of millions on top of millions will starve to death? So, because in order to buy or sell, in order to get food, you have to accept the currency that is the mark of the beast. There's a fourth thing I want you to see. I want you to see the manifold carnage. It's in verse 7 and 8. It says, and when it opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast saying, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed him. And power was given in him over a fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword. One fourth of all people that are here will die because of War. The Bible says they will die because of hunger. People will starve to death. The Bible says because of the food shortage, the beast will become more ferocious because of a shortage of food and literally kill people. If we go back to that verse, that verse says a pale horse. The word pale comes from the Greek word chloros. We get the word chlorine gas, chemicals of mass destruction. Robert Oppenheimer, who developed the first atomic bomb, said, the next nuclear war, none of us can count on having enough living to bury the dead. There's a fifth thing I want you to see, and that's martyred Christians. Martyred Christians. So Pastor Benny, will people come to know Christ during the tribulation period? Yes. But I am convinced most of them will be martyred. Look what verse 9 says. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and the testimony they had. How will people be killed? The Bible tells us in Revelation 24, they'll be beheaded. They'll be beheaded. All I'm trying to say, folks, I don't want to be here. I made provision not to be here. Make sure you've made provision not to be here. Make sure your heart's right with God. Because we won't be here if you know Jesus. Somebody said, Pastor Benny, the people that are in heaven don't know what's going on on earth. I don't know about that. Look what verse 10 says. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Apparently the people that were in heaven knew what was going on on earth. All I'm trying to say, folks, I'm almost done. But I truly believe that God's trying to get a message to people. I believe God's trying to get a seriousness to people. I believe God's trying to get awakening to people. We've become, as the scripture said during the end times, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We've got time for everything, but we don't have time for God. We've got time for everything else, but we're too busy for God. Too busy to read the Bible, too busy to wait and pray, 
too busy to speak out kindly to someone by the way, too busy to care and struggle to think of life to come, too busy building mansions to plan for the heavenly home, too busy to help a brother who faces the winter blast, too busy to share his burden when self in the balance is cast, too busy for all that is holy on earth beneath the sky, too busy to serve the master, but not a one of us too busy to die. See, I got these five points. And I said, God, you're trying to get a message to us. You're trying to get a message to us. Matthew 24. This is the end times chapter. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ and they shall deceive many. I thought, there's the militant conquest. Verse six says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. There's the murderous conflicts. Verse seven, a nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines. There's the meager crops and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. There's the manifold carnage. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you there's the martyred Christians. What's it going to be like, folks? You know, I've said, I don't want to scare people. I said, I don't want to scare people. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not even convinced I was right with that attitude. It's time we get some fear, folks. Matthew 24 and 37 says this, but as the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What were they doing? They were eating and drinking, marriage, giving in marriage. And Noah kept saying a flood's coming. People said, he's crazy, but the flood came. And preachers preach today. Somebody throws his heart out like I do, and they say, hey God, he's, he's, he's a, he's a madman. No, he's just preaching the Bible. I'm just preaching the Bible. And listen, I'm not smart enough to preach anything but the Bible, but I'm too smart to preach anything but the, but the Bible because we need God's Word more than we need anything else because the grass is going to wither, the flower is going to fade, but the Word of God is going to stand forever. I was watching this week a, a meteorologist. You can go online and see it. He was given the weather report of a tornado. And he was given the weather report, Doc. And he said, wait. The tornado's right over my house. You can watch it. And he picks his cell phone up and he says, son, son, get in the basement. Get in the basement now. Get in the basement. Bye. And then he says, folks, ladies and gentlemen, the storm, as we can see, and I thought, he wanted to make sure his family was right. He wanted to make sure his family was safe. And I thought about Noah. Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17, look what it says. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Look, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah said, no, the flood's coming. I've got fear. I've got fear because some of my family's not ready. And ladies and gentlemen, that ought to be our hearts. Our hearts ought to say, listen, I've got family. I can justify them. I can justify them. But get real, folks. They have no desire for God. They have no desire for the things of God. You've got to be honest about where they're at. You've got to be honest about where they're at. When I became a Christian, there was a song that they used to sing. The title of the song is, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. Life was filled with guns and wars. And all of us got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. 
There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. A man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears and one standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make sure we're all ready. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What have you got to do to be ready? You've got to accept grace. You've got to accept that Jesus died on a cross for you. And you've got to accept the free gift of salvation. And then you're ready. Then you're ready. Then you can be like Apostle Paul and say, I'm now ready. (laughs) I'm now ready. You don't want to leave here today not ready. You want to leave here today and be able to say, I'm now ready. (laughs) I'm now ready. Because you can be ready through Jesus Christ.